in a group any subset of its elements that itself enjoys the properties of a group, namely associativity, closure, identity, and inverse properties, that subset is then called a subgroup. In our previous video, we saw one of the cheap and easy ways to make subgroups is to make cyclic subgroups. Take the set of all the powers of one element. We're always guaranteed to get a subgroup in that process. We can prove that. What's less clear is if somebody just hands me a subset and asks me, is this thing a subgroup? Maybe it's not always an easy question to answer. Fortunately, in this video, we'll see that there's a set of results, three results, that do make it easier to check. So we don't have to always necessarily directly check the associativity, closure, identity, and inverse properties. Um, when we checked subgroup status before, um, we weren't very thorough about it in the previous video. We listed the elements of the subgroup. We said, yeah, it looks like it's probably closed. We can see an identity here. Here are the inverses. But it's not always going to be practical to list out all the elements in, in a subset, or list out all the elements in a group, for that matter, uh, to verify that they are one thing or another. So the real benefit of having high-powered theorems like the one we're about to see is that they give us the tools to check uh, whether something is a subgroup in this example without having to get our hands dirty and put our fingers on all the elements. So this set of theorems is called the set of subgroup tests. And they come in three flavors, a one-step test, a two-step test, and then what I call a finiteness test. And they're ways of telling whether a subset that you give me actually rises to the level of being a subgroup. So I'm going to present the proof of just the one-step test in this video, um, but you should convince yourself that the two-step test and the finiteness test uh, are also equivalent uh, to the one-step test that we'll look at. So the one-step test says that a subset, H, is actually a subgroup inside of G. If it's true that for all A and B in my set H, the product A times the inverse of B belongs to H. This is a bit like saying when our group was the group of integers under addition, um, then if I have a subset of integers, that subset will be a subgroup if it's closed, so this is very much like a closure property. The difference is that there's an inverse on this second element here. So rather than thinking of that in the integer case as being closed under addition, this is more like closed under subtraction. So somehow it should be a little bit surprising that if I have a subset of the integers, which are a group under addition, if I have a subset of the integers that's closed under subtraction, then according to the one-step test, that's enough to guarantee that that subset is actually a subgroup of the integers. Uh, so that's the one-step test. The two-step test uses the original operation instead of the somehow the inverse operation. So this says that if in my subset for all A and B their product or their operation, if the result of combining A and B with the operation of the group G belongs to H, so if H is closed under the group operation, and if all the inverses of the elements of H are also elements of H. So that's a two-step test for that reason, because we have two things to verify. Then it will follow that H is a subgroup of G. And the third version of these subgroup tests put in one additional criterion to, to lower the bar a little bit. If my subset H is a finite set, and it's closed under the, the operation of G, the operation of the group G, then that too will be enough to guarantee that H is a subgroup. So depending on the situation, some of these are easier to, to check and to verify and to use in proofs than others, but all three of them have equal explanatory power. If any one of them is satisfied, then all three of them are satisfied, and more importantly, that makes H a subgroup of G. So let's actually prove the one-step test. In order to do any of these proofs, we need to show that any subset that satisfies the property that we're claiming here is a group in and of itself using the operation of G. So we have to verify associativity holds, closure holds, the identity property holds, and the inverses property also has to hold. So we'll check those one at a time in the case of my uh, subgroup test number one, the one-step uh, one subgroup test. So assume that my subset H meets this criterion. So assume that for all A and B in my subset H, the product A times B inverse belongs to H. So assume that's true. We're going to show that then H meets all four of these criteria to be a subgroup of G. Why does the associativity property hold? Well, because this operation in the group G is already associative. We know it's associative because G is a group. 
And if it's associative on all the elements of G, then because H is a subset of G, it's also associative on all the elements of H. So associativity is, is easy and quick. We don't have anything to prove because this is already an associative operation by assumption. So how about the identity property? So why does H satisfy the identity property? How do we know the identity element is here just because this group is closed under subtraction, right? this combination of the operation with the inverse of an element? Why is that true? To prove that, I'm just going to pick any element in H. And by the way, I've assumed here that H is a non-empty subset. I suppose I should have made that assumption explicit. So please do add this to your definition of subgroup, because we want the subset H to be non-empty in order to qualify because there's no such thing as an empty group. Why? Because every group has to have an identity, right? because the identity property needs to be satisfied. So we need this H to be non-empty as well for the same reason. So if H is non-empty, I can pick up an element of H. Let's call it X. Now because my set is closed under subtraction, then if I take that X and I apply this combination to X and itself, I'm going to get what I want. So by this assumption, for all A and B in the set H, A times B inverse belongs to H. If the roles of A and B are both played by the same element X, then the product A times B inverse is going to be X times X inverse. But X times X inverse by the inverse property of a group, and that is a product inside the group G, so the inverse property of G is all that we're using to substantiate this. X times X inverse is the identity element of G. And therefore, by this logic, the identity element of G belongs to my subset H. And that verifies the identity property for the subset H. How about the inverses property? We're going to do that one next. Let's again, because H is non-empty, let's pick up an element of H. Let's call it X. Now, according to this property that we're assuming, right, the one-step test criterion, I can take X and I can take any other element of H, and the difference that thing times the inverse of the other thing is going to belong to H. Now that I know that I have an identity element inside of H, I'm going to make the identity element my other element. So let's let the roles of A and B be played by the identity element and my X. Then by this assumption, identity times the inverse of X belongs to H. But again, by the identity property of the group G, E times the inverse of X is equal to the inverse of X. So we have in fact proved that the inverse of X not only belongs to G, because G is a group and satisfies the inverse property, but moreover, it belongs to H by this assumption. So the inverse's property is satisfied. The only one that's left then is closure. How do we know that given any two elements of H, that their product belongs to H? So now I have to pick up two elements of H. Again, it's, H is not empty, so I can pick up elements as much as I want. We don't know that these are different elements. That actually doesn't matter to our proof. All right, so I'm going to want to invoke this one-step test assumption again in this step. But because the one-step test assumption has an inverse on this B that I don't want to be there to meet my closure criterion, right? what I'm going to do is take one of my elements, say Y, and just replace it with its inverse. How do I know I can do that? Because we've just shown that the inverses of all elements of H are in H. So if X and Y belong to H, that means that Y inverse also belongs to H because of what we just proved. And now I can invoke this property with the role of A being played by X and the role of B being played not by Y, but by the inverse of Y. So by this property, if I put an X in place of the A, a B, uh, sorry, a Y inverse in place of the B, then this property tells me that X times the inverse of Y inverse is guaranteed to be an element of H. But what's the inverse of Y inverse? By the uniqueness of inverses in a group, the inverse of Y inverse is in fact Y itself. And therefore, we've concluded that XY must belong to H. That verifies the closure property. And now we've met all four criteria for the subset H to be a group in its own right under the operation that it inherited from the group G. So there's a proof of the one-step subgroup test. And what we'll see in our next video
Uh, we're going to turn the page a little bit and begin talking a little bit about the idea of the commutative property. When does it hold, and, and when it holds, what can we say about it? Um, but we're actually going to use one of these subgroup tests in the process of writing one of our later proofs. So that's where we're going to go in our next set of videos.